Right, so I've already done a much longer two-parter video on this before, but I want to return back to it to give a little summary, which to be honest is probably going to be the easiest way going forward for me to make these shorter videos, hopefully shorter videos, because otherwise I'll just elaborate and elaborate and elaborate. So I think this is something I might repeat going forward for this channel. If I make a video on a topic, the first time I talk about it, I'm going to go into it in as much detail as I like, explore every nook and cranny, but eventually I'll return back to it and hopefully make a shorter video and one which maybe you can share uh, and people will you know, not have their patience tried as much. Of course, it doesn't mean I need to jump into it real quick. But yeah, I'll just say uh, if, if somebody's going to comment below making an objection based on something which I haven't elaborated on, then please check out the two part of video first. If this video is enough for you, that's great. But if you're going to complain because you feel like there's something I glossed over, something I simplified, whatever else, well, it's the shorter video. I'm going to try and summarize everything as quickly as possible. I'll just give one quick caveat, which is that really the title of this video should probably have a compared to America on the end of it, because that's mostly going to be the contrast I'm drawing between the United Kingdom and America. Anyway, so I'm going to jump into my reasons, and it's going to be a repeat of the three reasons I made in my last video, plus a fourth bonus reason, which is actually the main reason why I'm making this video, to include that fourth bonus reason. So reason number one is Marxism and class consciousness. And basically, the summary here is that America is way more about race. It's just race is way bigger of an issue in America. Whereas conversely, in the UK, things are way more about class. I've recently been watching the YouTube channel Knowing Better, uh, and he makes lots of interesting videos about different kind of political issues in America. And something that is shocking is how reliably it all comes back down to race. And, you know, I don't think it's just knowing better making it all about race. I think in reality, race is this really, really huge thing in the United States. It's kind of the preeminent political divide in the United States. And conversely, in the UK, that just isn't really true. Now, I'm not saying there's no racism in the UK. That would obviously be stupid. What I'm saying is that in America, really key moments in American history, things like the American Civil War come down to race, really, when you really break it down. And conversely, in the UK, I mean, every like, is there really any major political moment in the UK that really comes down to race? I mean, if you compare, for example, our civil war, that was about the Republican kind of parliamentarians versus the monarchy and the aristocracy. And what does this indicate? Well, it indicates that the UK has historically been and presently is way more about class. Class is the big thing that matters in the UK. And the UK is ultimately, and I don't even think this is a controversial thing to say, way more class conscious than America. Americans famously don't really have any conception of themselves as working class, middle class, upper class. Basically, every single American, like 90% of Americans, seem to think of themselves as middle class. Conversely, in the UK, we have much more of a sense of the upper class, the middle class, the working class. Way more people who actually are working class recognize themselves as such. Way more people are willing to talk about the reality that we have an upper class that controls huge amounts of stuff. Uh, yeah, the reality is that we are just a way more class conscious society. And the consequence of this is that the UK is way more receptive to Marxist rhetoric. And this is significant because Marxism is all about material reality. And the uh, opposite to materialism is idealism. So if you're talking about idealism, these would be ideas like the white race, white superiority, uh, you know, things like that, things which have defined a lot of the political divides in America. Whereas in the UK, we're way more interested in material concerns. Who controls all the money? In what ways are certain people being disadvantaged due to poverty? Uh, ultimately, in the UK, it comes way more down to uh, the reality of these material modes of oppression rather than oppression by ideas, which is uh, much more of an established thing in the United States. Now, of course, somewhere else where this distinction between idealism and materialism is really obvious is in the discord around transgender identity. The material analysis would say, well, let's look at the reality of biological sex. If you ask almost any Marxist who is actually a serious Marxist, they should be able to tell you that the root of women's oppression lies 
in uh, the reality of the female sex and the female sex existing and how the female sex has been uh, treated within the economic systems that have developed in humanity. Uh, whereas, of course, the contrast to this would be idealism, the idea that there is some woman essence, uh, some idea of woman or some idea of man, and that being you know, that idea can actually influence material reality, that if you have the idea that you're a woman, even when you're biologically male, then you are in fact a woman. Of course, that is complete idealism and completely contrary to Marxist materialist analysis. And honestly, I'm still so shocked whenever I see somebody who's kind of uh, putting on the facade of being a really serious, hardcore Marxist, and then they have like trans women or women in their bio. And I understand most people are probably more offended by tankies because of just the moral implications of tanky ideas. For me, uh, if I see a tanky with pronouns in their bio, the biggest concern I have there is just the uh, sheer hypocrisy of, and you know, intellectual inconsistency of holding those two beliefs at the same time. I also find it equally ridiculous when there are gender critical people who seem to think that trans identity is some kind of evil Marxist ploy. And, uh, you know, I'll see people who I otherwise agree with on everything being like, we need to defeat the evil Marxists because they're trying to spread gender ideology. And it's like, no, no, that's the opposite to the truth. Um, which, you know, I don't blame people for not really knowing what Marxism is in this day and age. But yeah, uh, suffice it to say that the fact that Marxism is actually quite popular in the UK uh, has been to the advantage of the gender critical movement. Now, obviously, most of the UK is not Marxist, but most of the UK, I would say, is class conscious. And class consciousness allows for Marxist rhetoric to permeate the left a lot more generally. So if you take somebody like J.K. Rowling, J.K. Rowling is a liberal. She is very, very liberal. And you might say, well, surely the fact that J.K. Rowling is one of the most high profile British gender critical people, and she's not a Marxist, she's a complete lib, surely that contradicts what I'm saying. But you have to bear in mind that one of J.K. Rowling's um, foremost stated influences in becoming gender critical is Magdalene Burns. And Magdalene Burns was a hardcore socialist activist. She used to distribute leaflets for the Socialist Labour Party, and her mum was one of the founders of the Communist Party of Great Britain. And by the way, the Communist Party of Great Britain is still super awesome. They're still pushing back against trans identity nonsense. Um, and they're definitely, of all the communist parties in the UK, and there are quite a few, they're definitely the best. But the point is, Magdalene Burns was a socialist. Magdalene Burns was a Marxist. And Magdalene Burns was the person who convinced liberal J.K. Rowling to be gender critical. Now, imagine if J.K. Rowling was instead American. Would she have been subject to the Marxist influence that permeates the British left? No. She'd probably have never engaged with any views outside of the elite liberal bubble that I imagine any American equivalent to J.K. Rowling would live in. And if J.K. Rowling had been an American, I can almost guarantee she never would have been subject to the Marxist ideas that exist in the British left, and instead she'd be giving garbage takes on Twitter about how some women have penises. A good example of how J.K. Rowling's gender critical views don't really come from the liberal ideas that can be found in America, but more so from the Marxist ideas, which are more often found in the UK, is that uh, the channel Sean, which I'm sure you've all heard of, made a video attacking J.K. Rowling basically for being a liberal. Now, of course, Sean has also in the past attacked J.K. Rowling for uh, her views on trans identity. Now, you would assume that while Sean was attacking J.K. Rowling for being a liberal, he would have related that to her views on trans identity. I mean, if he disagrees with her on both of these points, why would he not try to relate them to each other? But he doesn't, which to me seems to be tacitly admitting that the objection that J.K. Rowling has to trans identity does not come from her liberal beliefs. It comes from Marxist beliefs, like the Marxist beliefs of Magdalene Burns, who was the person who ultimately convinced J.K. Rowling to become gender critical. Ultimately, almost all gender critical people in the UK are left of centre, so it matters a lot that in the UK there is a lot of Marxist rhetoric going around which can provide the case against trans identity from a left-wing perspective, uh, so that whether they realise it or not, many gender critical people who live in the UK can actually be influenced by that rhetoric. And that is why so many people in the UK who would not under any circumstance really want to move over to the right or would ever consider themselves right wing politically 
are still able to oppose trans identity because actually the case against trans identity not only can be made from the left, but I would argue is more consistently uh, and logically and morally and ethically soundly made from the left, from the Marxist perspective. And that's why some of the, the big parties, like the Social Democratic Party, of course, the already mentioned Communist Party of Great Britain, uh, and indeed, I think the Workers' Party, uh, which is being operated by George Galloway, all three of these parties have people quite high up who are critical of trans identity, and all three of these parties are coming from a left-wing perspective. Now, on the subject of political parties, we need to move on to the second reason why the UK is, you know, has far more gender critical people, which is uh, politics and the actual kind of political structure of the UK. In the UK, there is simply way more diversity of thought that is viable when it comes to looking at our political system, because we have quite a variety of parties you can pick from. Uh, even, you know, the Greens actually control seats in the House of Commons. Uh, you know, there's all of, all of these different national parties. Uh, there's, of course, UKIP, Conservatives, Labour, Lib Dems, and that's not even getting into the much smaller parties, which, yeah, sure, aren't likely to be forming a government anytime soon, but they could actually, genuinely, uh, with, you know, maybe a little bit of a shift in the Overton window, maybe a, you know, uniquely competent leader who's able to get their message out there, uh, become a major party. Indeed, there are plenty of parties that are major in the UK, major players winning uh, quite a decent proportion of the vote, which weren't actually, well, maybe even parties at all, but certainly weren't relevant parties, even just a few decades ago. So ultimately, there are simply way more options for how you can think about politics in the UK. And indeed, actually, a lot of parties are quite fluid in terms of where their political position is. The consequence of this is that there aren't really any obvious pre-packaged political positions in the UK. Now, if you compare this to America, there very much is a quite strict binary where you're either left or right. And to be honest, it's very easy to see in almost every single case, uh, you can tell, well, is this what the Democrats believe or is it what the right believes? In the US, almost every single issue has become politicized. There's the left wing view or the, you know, let's be honest, not really left wing, but uh, the Democrat view or the Republican view. Almost every single issue has become politicized in this way. And this is in dramatic contrast to the UK, where there are a huge number of issues which are multi-partisan, where uh, there are disagreements within each party and there is lots of agreement across broad parties, across the political spectrum. Uh, there are very few issues where you would actually say, well, you'd only support that if you're a Republican. You'd only support that if you're a Democrat. Obviously, you wouldn't say that at all in the UK because we don't have this party. But the point is, you know, you only say that if you support the one big right wing party. Whereas in the US, it's almost like, like I say, there is this obvious prepackaged binary. And if you really didn't want to think very hard, you could just be like, well, I'm just going with the blues no matter what. And with that in mind, as soon as it became established that if you're on the blue team, if you're on the Democrat team, you believe that trans identities are valid, it becomes much harder to have any diversity of thought within the kind of uh, left of the Overton window. Again, not really left, but according to the American system, the Democrats are on the left. Uh, it becomes much harder to have diversity of thought uh, once it becomes established that, oh no, the left wing side, the people who are left of center are the ones who affirm trans identity. The people who are right, right of uh, the center are the ones who reject trans identity. Now, what also helps with accommodating this diversity of thought is the fact that the conservative party in the UK really isn't that terrible. Now, I say this tentatively because I still don't like the conservative party of the UK, admittedly, mostly for their rubbish economic policies. But it's worth noting when it comes to social stuff, the Conservative Party is the party that legalised gay marriage in the UK. Indeed, David Cameron, uh, our Prime Minister just over five years ago, referred to it as the greatest achievement of his term in office, of, of his you know government at that time. And that would speak to the fact that, of course, the Conservative Party is not the Republican Party. You know, the Conservative Party is not a party that's trying to outlaw abortion, to massively restrict women's rights in all sorts of ways, to restrict the rights of same-sex attracted individuals. And yet the shocking thing is, despite the fact that the Conservative government isn't ideologically terrible, and they're also really the only major party that's shown any interest at all in protecting women's sex-based rights, 
I didn't vote for them, I spoiled my ballot, and overwhelmingly on Twitter, I saw people talking about uh, the Conservatives as an option, but an option they weren't going to take because they also were planning on spoiling their ballot, certainly not voting for Labour or the Lib Dems or any other party that doesn't have any respect at all for women's sex-based rights. I only saw one tweet and, you know, obviously I mostly follow gender critical people on Twitter. Uh, I That's pretty much what I use Twitter for, just, uh, you know, connecting with my gender critical peeps. And I only saw one tweet saying that uh, somebody was planning on voting for the Conservative Party. One tweet from a gender critical person. And even then, they were saying that they were doing it begrudgingly. They weren't doing it because they really supported the Conservatives. And also, the majority of the comments were people saying, you know what, you do you, but I personally, I still can't bring myself to do it. I just can't bring myself to vote for the Conservatives. Uh, and this is why I find the claim that the gender critical movement is in some way right wing, funded by the right wing or secretly right wing or whatever else, to be one of the most offensively inaccurate statements ever. The gender critical movement is by no means right wing. Now, here's the thing. Consider the fact that in the UK, the majority of gender critical people clearly are still not happy to have the conservatives represent them and then realize how much worse the Republicans are. I mean, recent events have made it very clear that if you care about women's rights, you sort of have to fall in line and vote blue no matter the gender woo, because the Republicans actively want to harm women. And obviously, any interest at all they're showing in protecting children or protecting women's sports is completely disingenuous. They are a terrible, evil party, wrong on pretty much every single point, and of course, the only point they happen to be right on is the point which, to be honest, everyone should be right on. It should be right up there with the fact most Republicans, most, I would hope, recognise that the Earth isn't flat. Most Republicans are able to recognise that biological males can't be women. That's the one thing the Republicans have got right, uh, and I think they did it sort of by accident, sort of just based on the fact that uh, they were able to look at reality and accurately describe it, which, to be honest, shouldn't really even be considered a political position. Now, there are some women in America who are still trying to work across party lines and, you know, talk to Republican legislatures about, uh, you know, defending women's sports and all of that, but they are few and far between, and that doesn't really surprise me. Of course, in the UK, there are way more people willing to work across party lines all over the place talking about gender critical ideas, which makes it much easier to be gender critical in the UK. It's very easy for organisations like the LGB Alliance to entertain working with the Conservatives when the Conservatives are the party that brought in gay marriage. It's very easy for feminist groups to entertain working with the Conservatives when there's really no indication at all that the Conservatives are on the verge of taking away women's reproductive freedom. So there we go. The reality of the political options available to a gender critical person is one reason why you're likely to see more gender critical people in the UK. Now, the third issue is the media. Uh, and quite simply put, the British media tries to be less biased. And this is why the trans identity debate gets a lot more attention, because it's a division within the left. The BBC shouldn't be constantly hammering the left with criticisms from the right. That would go against their stated goal of being neutral and unbiased. However, they can get away with asking questions if those questions are being asked by the left. If people who are enthusiastic Labour supporters are nonetheless faced with the reality that they are struggling to support Labour when Labour is standing against fighting for women's sex-based rights, well, the BBC can sort of ask about that to their heart's content, because they're not showing a biased preference for either side, they're talking about a division within one side. If every single gender critical person I know would quite happily vote Labour if Labour just sorted out their views on women's sex-based rights, then the BBC can be quite comfortable in feeling that they are not being biased by prejudicing anti-Labour views against Labour views. They're just talking about a criticism within Labour. Now, by contrast to all of this in America, there isn't any attempt at nuance. There's nothing to be gained from bringing up difficult objections within the right or the left. 
This would simply turn off the viewers who are mostly just tuning in so that they can watch their side be right. Ultimately, the people who are watching Fox News aren't watching Fox News because they want to see a debate about all of the complicated issues within the right wing. They just want to be told that the right wing is united and awesome and fantastic because, obviously, American media is much more willing to play fully into the biases of their viewership. This is why Fox News fell quite rapidly in line behind Trump. Conversely, in the British news, there's the standard that you have to be unbiased, and therefore British news loves a civil war. It loves being able to cover these contentious issues without even risking people thinking that they are exposing one side or giving favour to one side over the other. What the BBC wants to be able to do is cover issues where there are divisions across the political spectrum, so they're not seen as showing preference for one side over the other. And this is why this gender identity conflict, which is a perfect example of that, is getting a lot more exposure in British media. Still not that much, but uh, a lot more certainly than is in the US. I can't imagine the last time in the uh, American media, mainstream American media, anybody saw anything about like the gender critical feminists. Uh, but certainly in the UK, it's way more exposed in contrast. And this exposes way more of the British public to the trans identity debate. Now, as promised, we need to get to the fourth and final reason, and this is the bonus reason I didn't cover in my last attempt at addressing this issue, and that is the uh, relevance of the medical industrial complex. So the US is kind of in what I like to call a, a negative Goldilocks zone when it comes to the uh, trans identity issue. And this is because, firstly, the US has healthcare that is very much for profit. And this is in contrast to the rest of the developed world. Every other developed country, uh, medicine, you know, people being sick and dying is not viewed as a viable opportunity to earn some fat cash. <laughs> now, the second factor is that the US population has a large amount of disposable income. Now, these two factors in combination create a massive incentive to push an ideology that will encourage people to spend part of their income, a significant part of their income, on getting all of this medical treatment, which is in reality not necessary. The medical industrial complex has every reason to try to push this idea that trans identity is valid because trans identified people are likely to get this surgery and this surgery is expensive. It brings in the big bucks. Now, conversely, there isn't a direct economic incentive to push gender woo in the UK. So all we get is the bleed over of the facade that this is about something more than lining the pockets of the medical industrial complex. Obviously, it's worth noting that clearly most people who believe in uh, trans identities being valid and, you know, the whole gender woo thing are, are not people who consciously are advocating for more money to the medical industrial complex. No, they're doing it because they believe it's progressive, it's woke, it's whatever else. Um, and of course, all of those ideas do spread. They spread to the UK, they spread to uh, all these other places, but ultimately, why is it so much more popular in the US? Why did a lot of this stuff start in the US? Well, I imagine it has something to do with the people who were making significant amounts of money by offering up the service that this uh, ideology makes necessary. Although to be fair, I will admit I'm being a bit simplistic by acting as if gender ideology is only about lining the pockets of the medical industrial complex and making the money. Obviously it's about a bit more than that. It's about misogyny, homophobia, and class injustice. So there we go. Those are some other uh, reasons why you might want to affirm trans identity. Anyway, so hopefully this has answered the question of why is the UK so gender critical? If you have any other reasons you can think of, feel free to leave those in the comments below. I will say that I've never been, you know, a patriot in terms of having an unconditional love for my country, but I have become increasingly fond of the UK recently. And mostly this has come from looking into US history as it pertains to US political culture and realizing how much this contrasts with the UK in ways that make it clear that the UK is just a lot better. Uh, and I'm really happy I live here and not there. Ultimately, is the UK the best country in the world? Well, I don't know. We've got a lot of ugly people here, but there are some good reasons to like the UK too. And one of those is definitely the fact that the UK is so gender critical. Anyway, 
Uh, if you like this video, please do like, share, subscribe, comment, all of that stuff. If you know you see people talking about why is it it's always British people who are gender critical, obviously, you know, I I do see comments um, sometimes, sometimes when I've spoken about stuff and people get linked to my videos or whatever else, uh, I'll see people comment like, oh, why is it always a British person? Well, this is the answer to that question. I mean, it's a question that I've thought about myself and these are the answers I've come up with. So yeah, uh, if you see somebody asking that question, you can share this video with them. Uh, if you want to support what I'm doing, you can give on Patreon and, you know, uh, that's really appreciated. Every little helps. Uh, you know, if you just give a dollar, that would be great. And you will get a shout out in the in the credits. So with that said, I'll just say thank you to my current patrons. In addition to the names scrolling past on your screen right now, I would like to give a special thanks to last month's patrons, one of whom does not want to be mentioned by name. But apart from that, Lemonade and Citrus. You're all very appreciated.